Uh, October 31st, 2017, a couple years ago, uh, marked the 500th anniversary of the Protestant Reformation. On October 31st, 1517, Martin Luther took a stand against the Pope and the church and nailed his 95 theses, denouncing the Pope's authority and declaring that salvation is by faith and not by works. This, however, would not be the only stand that Luther would take. Uh, Six years later, called before the Holy Roman Emperor Charles V, he was asked to respond to his statements. And he took a day to pray, and he came back and said this, Since your most sincere majesty and your high mightiness require of me a simple, clear, and direct answer, I will give one, and it is this. I cannot submit my faith either to the Pope or to the Council because it is as clear as noonday that they have fallen into error and even into glaring inconsistencies with themselves. If then I am not convinced by proof from Holy Scripture or by the cognitive reason, if I am not satisfied by the very text I have cited, and if my judgment is not in this, in this way brought into subjection to God's word, I neither can nor will retract anything, for it cannot be either safe or honest for a Christian to speak against his conscience. Here I stand. I cannot do otherwise. God help me. Amen. Where do you draw your line? What do you stake your life in? What have you resolved to believe? What do you do in the midst of opposition? What do you do when asked to assimilate to sinful, ungodly behavior? How strong is your resolve? Would you be willing to die for it? These were the questions that were present and real in Daniel's life as he was captive in exile. Two weeks ago, we saw that God is faithful to exile in verses 1 through 7. We saw that it was God who gave Jehoiakim into the hands of Nebuchadnezzar. God in his sovereignty and power orchestrated the exile of his people into Babylon. Today, my hope is that we see that the God who is faithful to exile is also the God who is faithful in exile. God is faithful in exile, as we will see in our passage, because he is preserving a remnant, a people group. So follow along on the screen as I read Daniel chapter 1, verses 8 through 16, or you can turn to your pew Bibles or your personal Bibles. The pew Bible is found in page 737. And the word of the Lord reads, But Daniel resolved that he would not defile himself with the king's food or with the wine that he drank. Therefore he asked the chief of the eunuchs to allow him not to defile himself. God gave Daniel favor and compassion in the sight of the chief eunuch. And the chief of the eunuchs said to Daniel, I fear my lord the king who assigned your food and your drink. For why should he see that you are in worse condition than the youth who are of your own age? So would you endanger my head with the king? Then Daniel said to the steward whom the chief of the eunuch had assigned over Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, test your servants for ten days. Let us be given vegetables to eat and water to drink. Then let our appearance and the appearance of the youth who eat the king's food be observed by you and deal with your servants according to what you see. So he listened to them in this matter and tested them for 10 days. And at the end of 10 days, it was seen that they were better in appearance and fatter in flesh than all the youth who ate the king's food. So the steward took away their food and the wine they were to drink and gave them vegetables. It's the word of the Lord. God is a faithful God in exile who preserves a remnant. This morning, what we'll do is we're going to take a look at the characteristics of the remnants of God. And the three characteristics that we'll see is that God's remnant is a remnant that is resolved, bold, 
and holy. So let's begin by taking a look at what it means for God's remnant, God's people to be resolved. We read in verse 8 that Daniel resolved that he would not defile himself. Now, scholars present many reasons as to why he didn't, as to how he would defile himself through the king's food. But before we get to those reasons, I want to define what defilement mean, meant for Daniel. Defilement is the action of separating or breaking a covenant or relationship. Let me see if I can explain. See, most of the times when we think about defilement, we think about our, our white rug or our, our white dress or our white shirt and walking with dirty boots and all over the mud and, sort of, and walking in, into the rug with all our dirty boots and, and getting it all dirty or, or, uh, or, or, or putting ketchup in our white shirt and we sort of defiled it. We've made it dirty. But, but for Daniel, that wasn't the only case of defilement. You see, for Daniel, defilement, and for the people of God, defilement was a personal, relational, breaking. Let me, let me give you a couple of verses that, that show that defilement meant more than just getting something dirty, but breaking a covenant or a relationship. Jeremiah 3 verse 1 says, If a man divorces his wife and she goes from him and becomes another man's wife, will he return to her? Will not that, uh, would not that the land be greatly polluted? You have played the whore with many lovers, and would you return to me, declares the Lord? The polluted word there is the same as defiled. Ezekiel 37 verse 22 to 23 says, When God talking about the, sorry, when God talking about the restoration of, of, uh, of the nation, this is what Ezekiel says, or God says through the prophet Ezekiel, I will make them one nation in the land, on the mountains of Israel, and one king shall be king over them all, and they shall be no longer, and they shall be no longer two nations, and no longer divided into two kingdoms. They shall not defile themselves anymore with their idols and their detestable things, or with any transgressions. But I will save them from all their backslidings in which they have sinned, and I will cleanse them, and they shall be my people, and I will be their God. Last one, Isaiah 59 verse 2 says, But your iniquities have made a separation between you and your God, and your sins have hidden his face from you so that he does not hear. Whether it's through divorce or idolatry or sin, these passages point us to the main point, the main objective, that defilement broke a relationship. It broke a covenant. Divorce is defilement because it breaks a relationship. Idolatry is defilement because it breaks a relationship. Sin is defilement. Because it breaks a relationship. Daniel didn't resolve not to defile himself because he wanted to be clean. No, Daniel resolved not to defile himself because he didn't want to break his relationship between God and him. You see, unlike what Isaiah talks about in verse 2 in chapter 59, Daniel resolved to be a man to whom God would not turn his face away, and a man who God would hear because he had a relationship with him. So knowing and having an understanding of what defilement means, let's just take a, a, a look at what were possible reasons uh, that scholars present to, as to why the king's food would defile Daniel. Uh, the first possible reason presented by scholars is the ceremonial reason. Uh, some scholars believe that the thrust behind Daniel's resistance was based on a dietary issue. Uh, they believed that Daniel wanted to observe the Mosaic law, and in so doing, he would deny other foods and keep the dietary laws and not defile himself. However, th this line of thinking it, it doesn't provide a full answer for our, our, our passage this morning because wine was not among the unclean foods listed in Leviticus 11, so he could have drank the wine and not be defiled. 
So another possible reason that scholars give as to why the king's food might have uh, defiled Daniel is an idolatrous reason. Now, scholars, some scholars argue that the food might have been offered to idols before it came to Daniel and his friends. So eating food that was offered to idols would have defiled him because it was idolatrous. But, but even that sort of doesn't paint us a full picture because he eats vegetables and water. And, and it was possible that the vegetables could have been offered to idols as an offering. So that would have, might, have, might have defiled himself, but defiled him. The last possible reason presented by scholars is the assimilation or dependence reason. These scholars position that it was the desire of Daniel not to assimilate or depend on the king's food. You see, while Daniel was given an, a Babylonian name and given a Babylonian education, for Daniel, eating the king's food would have signaled a full assimilation, a full dependence on God, on, on the king, sorry. The, the problem was not that the food itself, the problem was not the food itself, but from where it came from. And, let, and, and let's just walk through the verse, because you'll see the, the break between the king's food and just the vegetables in the water. In verse 5, we, we read that the king assigned the food that he ate and he drunk to the youth. In our passage in verse 8, it is the king's food and the king's wine. When suggesting the 10-day test, Daniel talks about the king's food in verse 13. And after the test is completed, in verse 15, Daniel and his friends were better in appearance and fatter in flesh than all the youth who ate the king's food. But there's a break because when given the vegetables and the water, there is no mention that it comes from the king at all. He is receiving something that isn't coming directly from the king's table, which would have sig signaled to the people that Daniel was receiving something from the king. The vegetables in the water have no mention of the king. Daniel resolved not to be defiled because he didn't want to assimilate and depend on the relationship that would come from the king. So church, is this, the, is this a resolve of old? Is this a resolve that only fits for Daniel and his friends? The answer would be no. This is the resolve that we need in 2019. And, and, and if you think that this is not a resolve that God's people still have, let me give you an example from Pastor Wang Yi of Early Rain Covenant Church in China. Listen to, listen to the statement that he and his elders released what they would resolve to do in the face of persecution. They state, they state, under no circumstance will we stop or give, give up on gathering publicly, especially the corporate worship of believers on Sunday. God's sovereignty is higher than any secular authority, and the church's mission and the Bible's teaching on not neglecting to gather is higher than any secular law regardless of whether, religious, whether the Religious Affairs Bureau and the police take administrative and forceful measures towards Sunday worship, whether or not their enforcement follows due process, I will resist by peaceful means. I will not cooperate with the police banning, shutting down, dissolving, or sealing up the church and its gathering. I will not stop convening, hosting, and participating in the church's public worship until the police cease my personal freedom by force. Farther down in their statement, they say, whether in the police station, detention center, prison, or any other detention facility, I will share the gospel once I am in contact with any person. Secular government and laws have no right to deprive anyone of the opportunity to listen to the gospel, nor do they have the right to deprive a pastor the freedom to preach the gospel to others. 
Only the gospel of Christ can truly reform a sinner. I will do my utmost in my detention to practice the gospel commission unless the police torture me brutally to the point of crushing my health and spirit. This is a resolve of a church who has a deep and personal relationship with their God. Pastor Wang and the elders understand that by submitting to earthly authorities, they would not be submitting to their heavenly authority who has called them to declare and exalt the riches of God's glory. So they resist and resolve to love their God by being obedient to the call that he has placed in their life. This is the type of resolve that a lover has for his love loved one. This is the type of resolve that we are called to have towards Christ. This is the resolve that says boldly and loudly, I choose not to defile myself, and I choose to remain faithful and steadfast to my relationship with my Lord and my Savior, Jesus. This is the type of resolve that rids itself of worldly passions, self-glory and ease, and seeks the kingdom and the glory of God. Ultimately, Daniel and Hananiah, Mishael's, Azariah's, and Pastor Wong's resolve does not revolve around a certain action of whether they will be clean or not, but it revolves around a certain person. In each of these resolutions, the desire is not to just refrain from what defiles them. It's not just about not not eating a certain food or cowering down, but it is fully and faithfully and steadfastly keeping the intimate and personal relationship that they have with God. So will you resolve this morning? to not look at pornography? Will you resolve to honor your father and your mother? Will you resolve to forgive and not hold anger? Will you resolve to crush and dismantle the idol of family, food, money, respect, and pride? How will you resolve this year to not defile yourself? Brothers and sisters, I pray that these resolutions may not be resolutions for the sake of bettering your life or your moral character, but for the sake of growing in a deeper and more affectionate love for Jesus. I pray that you resolve to care more about your relationship with Jesus than, you desi- than, than your desire, than your own sinful desires. Because he's the only God who is great and deserves this type of relationship. God is a faithful God who desires a resolved remnant. God's remnant is resolved, but it is also bold. And in the face of danger and persecution, Daniel showed the ability to remain confident and courageous, not in himself, but in his faithful God. Daniel's boldness is twofold. His boldness is seen as he asks twice for the ability not to defile himself. He asks the the chief eunuch and then the steward, so he opens his mouth. But then his boldness is also seen and displayed in what he tells the steward in verse 13. He says, do with us as you see fit. So he's bold enough to declare, and then he's bold enough to say, Jesus, you're in charge, and may you do as you see fit. So you contrast it to the chief eunuch who feared for his life and did not acquiesce to Daniel's request because he feared the king, that he feared that the king would kill him. Daniel's boldness allowed him not to fear man, but to fear God. 
Daniel's decision to stand boldly against his superiors for the sake of undefilement was rooted in the fact, as we've already discussed, in that he had a personal relationship with his God. And he did not want to break that. He feared breaking his relationship more than he feared the consequences. As we play out the story Daniel is given favor and compassion from God. It's God's providence and grace that is seen as a reoccurring theme in chapter 1 and in the rest of the, uh, the, rest of the book of Daniel. Uh, we saw two weeks ago in verse, te- verse 2 that it is God who, is given, who gave Jehoiakim into the hands of Nebuchadnezzar. And this week we see that it is God who gives favor and compassion. God is in control and in charge. But in discussing God's providence and Daniel's boldness, it is important to note that Daniel's boldness does not spur God's providence. Daniel isn't being bold so that God would be moved to provide favor. No, Daniel is being bold because he knows he serves a God who pours out favor. Daniel's boldness stems and is rooted in his understanding of his God. So what does that mean for us? What does it mean to be bold like Daniel? Well, it means knowing your God. And knowing God, we have to see Jesus as our prime example and not Daniel. Christ declared boldly the truth of the gospel because he loved his father and his father has sent him. When speaking to the disciples, he would, before he would be betrayed, Jesus told them, I do as the father has commanded me so that the world may know that I love the father. Brothers and sisters, our boldness in Christ and for Christ arises when we, speak le- when we boldly speak the truth and boldly stand for the truth and realize that the results are not in our hands. This is the boldness of a Christian. This is the boldness of a, a Jesus follower. When we do what we're told and we let go of the consequences knowing that we serve a God who is in charge and sovereign over what's to come. We let go of the fear of whether we will be fired because we're proclaiming the gospel. We let go of control of whether we will be ostracized or isolated when, by our peers when we choose to be celibate. We let go of control of whether your kids will love you because you choose them to disciple you choose to disciple them in God's ways. We let go of control of your finances when God has called you to freely give. Looking at Daniel's example, boldness is not just opening our mouths, but is also in telling God and those who are superior to us. Deal with your servant according to what you see. May we be so bold to love our God enough, not because it's in us, but because it's in him and who he is. May we be so bold that in the face of temptation and persecution, we stand boldly and declare that I resolve not to defile myself. I boldly resolve not to break the relationship. This is a boldness that trusts and places its faith in God so much that it believes and chooses to follow the truth of God when he says, do not fear those who can kill the body, but fear him who can destroy both body and soul. May the words of Peter and John be true in our lives. 
whether it is right in the sight of God to listen to you rather than God, you must judge, for we cannot but speak what we have seen and heard. Church, may we stand boldly not because this is the right thing or this is what we're told to do. May we stand boldly because we are so deeply connected. We have such a rooted relationship with our God that there is nothing else that we can do but to stand boldly and say, I choose not to defile myself. God is faithfully preserving a remnant that is resolved, bold, and lastly, he's preserving a remnant that is holy. I, uh, I don't know about you guys, but I, I sort of have a, a morning routine. Uh, you might kill me for it. It's not the greatest morning routine, but I sort of I, I roll over, not, not willingly, but I roll over, and I, I grab my phone, and there are two things that I do every morning. I check ESPN to check the scores and see who won and who, you know. And then, and then I check Yahoo, because Yahoo is like my... my I, I, don't, I don't watch the news. Watching the news is just too much. But I just check Yahoo, and I just... Scroll, 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 and I find something that reads really funny or, or super serious. And I'm like, yeah, I got to read that one. And like, a couple of weeks, uh, there, was a, there was an article on Yahoo that, that, that read, uh, let, me, let me find you the, it said, actor Neil McDonald says he lost a job because he refused to do a sex scene. And I was like, holy moly, like, this is, this is kind of like, if you, if you know 2019, like, you turn on any movie or any show, and it's like sexuality everywhere. So, like, for a guy to resist this and for a guy to be fired for this, it's just crazy. Now, for those who, uh, who don't know who Neil McDonald is, uh, I know him as Damien Dark from Arrow. So, if you're a big Arrow fan, that's who Damien Dark is. Uh, he also appeared in Captain America and was Lieutenant Hawk in Star Trek First Contact that came out in 1996. I was six years old. I don't, I have no clue. <laughs> but nonetheless, right, I read the article and a few things stood out to me. He's quoted as saying, I won't kiss any other woman because these lips are meant for one woman. He's also, he's also quoted in saying, I couldn't get a job because everyone thought that I was a religious zealot. But what does this have to do with Daniel? What does is, what is, what is Mr. McDonald have to do with God preserving a remnant that is holy? Well, the reason I bring it up is for the same reason I, I clicked the article. It stood out. It was, it, it was an article that was in stark contrast to everything else that is going on in our world. Mr. McDonald separated himself from the world's demands, and it caused others, at least me, to notice. Scripture calls the action of separating oneself from the world holiness. When God, talking to the nation of Israel through Moses, he commanded that they be holy as he is holy. You see, God called the nation to be holy because it was through their separation from the worldliness that others would see that they were different. And it was in that separation that others would see that the Israelites sh chose to honor and worship Yahweh God. The nation was to be, a, to be separate, distinct, and different so that the nations around them would take notice and be forced to realize that Israel served no other God but God. In our passage, we see this distinction, this separation being, uh, uh, of Daniel and the youth. After going through the 10-day test of just eating vegetables and drinking water, Daniel, Hananiah, and the friends were better in appearance and fatter in the flesh. They were separated. They were, they were distinct. Now, uh, I don't know about you guys, but if you were to eat just vegetables and water and not 
eat the king's food and the wine, I'm pretty sure that you're not getting fatter. You're getting skinnier. And, and this is, this is a, 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 just a, a miraculous point to point out because there is no other word but, but a miracle. You, you don't, you don't uh, it, it takes more calories to eat a celery steak than it, is, than, than it does what it's put, getting put in. Right? You, don't eat, you don't eat vegetables and, and, and get fatter. And it's important to note this miracle because the God of Daniel is still a God of miracles who's working today, who's working miracles in his people, giving them life so that they can be distinct from that of the world. If you have a relationship with God, with Jesus, and you have made him your Lord and Savior, your salvation is a miracle. For a dead person, a sinful person, to be given life is a miracle. And this is the the grace-filled gospel of Jesus, that Jesus graciously and miraculously gives life and sight to those who are dead and blind. You see, the 10-day test was not a test to see which diet would result in better, uh, would result in better results, uh, or it was not a test to see whether Daniel provided a right diet for healthy living. No, the test presented the, 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 test presented the fact that God is greater than the king. God would be the one who would miraculously sustain. God would be the one who would strengthen. Daniel was separated and made distinct because God did the miracle. Just as God set aside Daniel from the youth, from the other youth, God is setting aside his church. God is setting aside FBC Sudbury. And ultimately, God sets aside and makes holy people because it points to a deeper reality. It points to a deeper truth that is to come. And this deeper truth, this deeper reality of what's to come is an eternal separation. Love what Pastor John MacArthur says in regards to the church's call to be holy, to be set aside. He says, There is no way biblically under the sun that the church could ever court the world. The church must be the conscience of the world. The church must be so well defined that it becomes the antagonist of the world. For those outside of Jesus Christ, this church, I trust, I pray, this church will be the most uncomfortable seat in the world because we present a gospel that divides. The truth of Jesus Christ is not a religious institution which welcomes everybody. It is the body of Jesus Christ set apart unto God, unequally married and wedded to the to the the self, wedded to the self same Christ, redeemed by life. People should know that we are so set aside and have such a deep relationship with our God that they see that we are different, that we are holy, not that we're better but that we have been set aside for God. And, and this might seem like it's di- uh, uh, divisive, and it is. Because without the separation, lost people wouldn't know that they are lost. Without the church having a deep relationship with its God, lost people wouldn't know what a deep and personal relationship looks like with God. So how do we direct our hearts in such a way that we would grow in holiness, fighting against the desires of the flesh, the sinful demands of this world, and pursue holiness? How are we set set aside if God isn't working through vegetables right now? And the answer is, is, is the theme that I've been saying all this morning. We are set aside with a relationship with Jesus. Our holiness, our separation from the world is seen in our love and relationship with Jesus. 
The passage this morning all starts with a relationship. Daniel chooses not to defile himself because he didn't want to break the relationship. Daniel chooses not to, chooses to be bold because of a relationship. And God is faithfully preserving Daniel and his friends because he ch- desires to have a relationship. It's only in Jesus that we as sinful human beings can be forgiven, given new life, and given a heart after God's righteousness. This is what separates us from the world, Jesus. Now, for those who are, 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 are just people who think of practical ways, like how do I lead today? What do I do today that's going to, uh, by God's grace, set me aside so that the Lord can do a great work in my heart and make me holy. Well, I just want to give just three quick things that we can do today that sets us aside. The first, every relationship starts with a conversation. So pray. Prayer sets you aside. Now, if you, if you I don't know what I should pray, uh, let me just give you an acronym. It's really easy. You can use ACTS, A C T S. A stands for adoration. Adore, G- adore Jesus. Adore God. He's the maker of heaven and earth. Adore him for how great he is. C, confess. Confess your sins before God and know that he is faithful and just to forgive you. T, Thanksgiving. Give thanks to God. Man, we have such a great list. Uh, we, I was putting on my mic, and the mic, he doesn't have, the mic doesn't have the fluffy thing right here in the ear. And I was like, man, first world problems. Like, can we thank God that we have our microphone, that I don't have to be shouting to you guys? Thank God for your salvation. Thank God for your family. Thank God for your health. Thank God uh, thank, thank God that we live in a, in a country that we can come here on a Sunday and not be persecuted. Thank God that we have brothers and sisters who are doing a great work, a great ministry in China, in Africa, in Australia, in Antarctica. Thank God for whatever it is because he is good and all good things come from him. And lastly, ask for supplication. Ask. Ask. (laughs) Ask the Lord. He's a good, good father. And he gives First John tells us that we, if we are saved and have an assurance in him, we can have a confidence in asking him. That's one thing you can do. Just pray. Second thing, second half of a conversation is listening. It's really bad to have a relationship in which you only talk and you don't ever listen. So how do we, how do we listen? Well, we read God's word. He's speaking through us through his word. Uh, and, and, and let me just give you, for those, man, like, I know I need to read, but I just don't have the time. Uh, Crossway, the, the Christian publishing company, came out with this uh, in November, came out with uh, stats on Bible reading. Let me just give you four stat, uh, five stats. In just 12 minutes per day of reading your Bible, you can read your whole Bible in a year. 12 minutes of reading your Bible, you can read your Bible in a year. In just six minutes per day, you could read the entire New Testament over the course of six months. It takes 74 hours and 28 minutes to read through the whole Bible. 74 hours and 28 minutes. If you are able to stay awake for three days, you can just plow the Bible. Just in the beginning, Revelation, amen. (laughs) You finished it. If you read the prophets 30 minutes a day in a month, You will have finished all 17 prophetic books. Listen, I get it. We're all pressed for time. We're all looking for time. But are we going to say that we don't have 12 minutes a day? It'll get us through the whole Bible. Let's just stop looking at Yahoo and ESPN. We're like, just keep reading. And the last thing, the last practical thing that you could do today to grow in your holiness, to grow in your separation from the world, is to be in relationship and in community. I didn't, I didn't say much about Daniel's friends in the sermon, but the passage makes it really clear that Daniel's not alone. 
As Daniel resolved, so did his friends. And this is why community is so important, because it's hard to do it on your own. And not only is it hard, Jesus called us to do it together. If Jesus had 12 guys, if Jesus brought three guys to pray for him as he was about to face the cross, what would make us think that we are able to do it alone? You're wrong if you think that. Find community. It reminds you of the grace of Jesus when you can't think about it. Earlier I said that the separation in this time points us to a greater separation that is to come. I just want to read you Jesus' words when he talks about this separation that is to come. He says in Matthew 25, When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, then he will sit on his glorious throne. Before him he will, be, he will gather all the nations. He will separate People from one another as a, shepherd, as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. And he will place the sheep on his right, but the goats on the left. Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you welcomed me. I was naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came to me. Then the righteous will answer him, saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you drink? And when did we see you a stranger and welcome you or naked and clothe you? And when did we see you sick or in prison and visit you? And the king will answer them. Truly, as I say to you, as you did it to one of the least of these, you did it to me. Then he will say to those on his left, depart from me. You cursed into the eternal fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me no food. I was thirsty, and you gave me no drink. I was a stranger, and you did not welcome me. Naked, and you did not clothe me. Sick and in prison, and you did not visit me. Then they will answer, saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry, or thirsty, or a stranger, or naked, or sick, or in prison, and did not minister to you? Then he will say, then he will answer them, saying, Truly I say to you, as you did it to as you did it to one of the least of these, you did, it, you did not do it to me. As you not, did not do it as to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. And these will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. We're going to be separated. I just, I just want to be separated onto God in the here and now and not eternally. I'll finish this morning by stating that we as a church are in exile. Like Daniel, we are living in a land that is not our own. Philippians 3 says our citizenship is in heaven. 1 Peter 2 says uh, we're sojourners. Hebrews 13 says for we, <clears throat> for we have no lasting city, but we seek the city that is to come. Church, may we be God's remnant. This church you, us, may we be a remnant that is resolved, that is bold, and that is holy because it loves as God. If you are not a believer in Christ, the God of miracles is calling to you and saying, I desire to work a miracle in you. I desire to have a relationship with you. Come. Come. I want to adopt you. I want to graft you into my family, into my remnant, and set you aside and use you. Let today be the day of your salvation. Let today, that, let today be the day that you say no to the king's food, to the passions of this world, and you resolve to trust Jesus. Jesus.